Hey everybody, welcome to Altium Academy. I am Zach Peterson, your local technical consultant with Altium. And today we are gonna talk about parasitics in a PCB layout and in your circuits. So we got a great viewer question asking about parasitics and how to simulate them, whether or not they can be done in Altium Designer and you know, kind of what those results look like. So we're gonna get into that just now with some of the background conceptual stuff. And then coming up, we've actually got a video on PDN impedance that takes a lot of this and applies it in real simulations. So for now, we're gonna talk about parasitics, how to spot parasitics in a PCB layout and what parasitics really are. Let's go ahead and get started. To get started, what are parasitics? There is a really simple answer and that is parasitics are any unintentional uh, uh, resistance, capacitance, or inductance that might exist in a physical layout for an electrical system or for an electronic system. What do I mean by unintentional capacitance or inductance? Well, if you think about it, even like a trace on your PCB has some capacitance and inductance. And really that trace capacitance and inductance is unintentional, meaning you didn't necessarily design it to be that way. It is a parasitic, meaning you didn't place like a discrete capacitor or a discrete inductor in order to give it those circuit qualities. That is what a parasitic is. It is something that exists in a physical layout that you didn't necessarily intend to be there. Vahap Vulkan Aban writes, Hello, Mr. Peterson. I've been following your informative PCB design guidelines, also presentations about Altium. This is actually quite a long question, but he goes on to ask about spice-based simulators and parasitics. And he basically brings up an example here with a DC-DC converter. And he brings up non-ideal parasitics. And he brings up the important point that there's always gonna be some non-ideal parasitics in the circuit, even if you try your best to eliminate them. So the question here is, can you simulate this on the board and what is that actually gonna look like in a real circuit? Okay, so there's a number of ways to deal with parasitics. To really simulate parasitics at any frequency range and in any of the ways that they might arise, you actually need a 3D field solver. So most EDA tools do not have a 3D field solver built into them that will give you a really nice clear picture of how parasitics affect a PCB layout. Generally, you have to interface with a third party tool to get that kind of information. Now, that being said, there is some work that you can do in 2D and Altium Designer does include a 2D field solver that does some work with parasitics and allows you to get some results in simulations. Same thing goes with the other major EDA vendors. They all have their own versions of these kinds of tools that will give you some results. Now, the other thing that you can do is you can actually get a lot of insight if you know which, uh, which parasitics to include in a spike simulation. So what we're going to go over in this video is to look at some ways and uh, some common areas where parasitics arise and the ways that you would actually include those in a spice simulation before you do the PCB layout. So the workflow here is know the parasitics first, include them in any front end engineering simulations that you might need to do. And then later, once you actually lay out the board to match those conditions, export your board into a more powerful field solver, and then you can get some more insight into how parasitics actually affect your PCB layout. Okay, so there's a few interesting places that parasitics will arise that you can actually use in a simulation, specifically in a spice simulation, to get some insight about your board. One of the common parasitics that you actually care about in something like moderate to high speed design is capacitance. So whenever you have a, let's say, your PCB layout here, this is just kind of the side view of two layers, and I've got my plane layer up here, and I've got a plane layer down here. These two things basically form a big capacitor. And, you know, we basically draw that something kind of like this. And that occurs because we have some dielectric here that fills in the space between these two plates. So let's say that this is brought up to a voltage of V, this is brought to ground, and we have a potential between them. We have some dielectric constant here, dk, 
And so because of that, there will be some capacitance between these two planes. So plane capacitance is kind of the standard one that we care about if you're doing any kind of high-speed design. Generally, when you are uh, doing any kind of simulation involving high-speed design, or when you're maybe uh, trying to figure out the impedance of your power delivery network, uh, basically you would have a power net and you would have a whole bunch of decaps here. And then in parallel with that, you basically have your plane capacitance. So you can include the plane capacitance in a SPICE simulation by literally just placing a capacitor component here. So Altium Designer has a library. It's the simulation generic components library that allows you to just place a, a regular old capacitor here to basically model this particular parasitic. Again, other EDA platforms, you can do the same thing. You can basically just place a capacitor in your schematics and that's what's gonna allow you to model this particular parasitic. Now, let's say, uh, for example, we had like a via transition or something like this somewhere going into our load. Uh, a via transition, if you know the structure of a via, you know that it's essentially a big cylinder of conductor. So we would model that as an inductance. It looks like an inductor and it kind of acts like an inductor. And it also has some DC resistance. So we would put some DC resistance in series with it. And so together, even though a via is just copper and it is conductive, it actually does have some parasitics. Okay, so this is how we would basically model our via. These are just really simple ways that you can think about this. Let's say that, you know, up here, and we've talked about this in other contexts as well, but let's say up here on the top layer, you know, I've got uh, some copper here and then maybe I've got like a trace over here. So maybe this is like copper pour and then this is a trace. Well, how does this and this have a parasitic? Well, we basically have here two pieces of copper. They might be brought up to different potentials and there's some dielectric between them. So there's some decay up here in between these two conductors. And so that creates also some capacitance. So that capacitance also then modifies the circuit behavior of this particular trace. So if you're familiar with like transmission line models for trace impedance, then essentially adding in this particular capacitance increases the total capacitance of the trace. And so this would bring down the impedance of that trace. In like a spice simulation, you would basically stick a capacitance in parallel with your, uh, with your block that represents your, uh, your transmission line. Pretty simple way to think about this. And in general, we only care about, uh, we only care about capacitances when they arise in parallel. And that's exactly where we put them in these types of simulations. Similarly, with parasitic inductances, we only care about them because they arise in series, kind of like this. So like with this via, it's perfect example. We want this to be a perfect conductor. We want it to act like just a regular wire. The problem is it doesn't. It has some finite DC conductivity. And then also its structure gives it some inductance. So next, I want to look a little more at an example that was brought up in the question. And the question brought up a specific example of like a DC-DC converter. When we have a DC-DC converter, we basically have uh, some input voltage and there may be like, you know, an input capacitor here. And then we come over here to a switching element and then we have another switching element. And there's gonna be some sort of driver over here that modulates these switching elements. And then up here we have our output inductor and then typically have an output capacitor. So we basically got a, a buck converter here. In this buck converter, when we lay it out in the schematic, you know, it nicely has this perfect behavior because we haven't accounted for any parasitics that exist in the real physical layout. So the PCB layout itself will have some parasitics, but also all of these components will have some parasitics. Now component parasitics, you can actually account for in a circuit diagram. So we're gonna show an example of this in, in a couple of upcoming videos on PDN impedance and how to actually do those simulations where we include all of the conduct or all of the uh, component parasitics. So for a capacitor, you know, we've talked about this before in our uh, capacitor self-resonance video, there's a parasitic 
uh, resistance here, and then there's a parasitic inductance here. So this resistance, uh, this is your uh, ESR or equivalent series resistance, and then this is your ESL or equivalent series inductance. And then you have a nominal capacitance. Some models will actually also include a parallel resistance to represent leakage. Um, typically for you know higher frequency simulations, we basically just leave that out. So if you're doing like power electronics where maybe this is used for, uh, this is used like as a safety capacitor or something, you might include that just to represent leakage current, but you don't have to do that. These leads may also have some inductance and then also some resistance. So you've got an L and an R here. Um, here, the modeling of the inductor, it actually has some parasitics. So there's, in the coil, you actually have winding capacitance. So there's winding capacitance in the coil. And then the coil has some finite DC resistance that you can account for as well, okay? Same thing here on this output capacitor. Everything we've done over here with ESR and ESL, we would have to do here on this. So we have some ESR and then we have some ESL. And so all of that should be included if you're doing any kind of circuit simulation, if you're designing this type of circuit. So what other kinds of parasitics could you have in the PCB layout? Well, all of these wires that you're using to connect everything basically have a little bit of inductance and a little bit of resistance. So these aren't the best inductor and resistor symbols, but you kind of get the idea. And then same thing over here. We would have a little bit of inductance and then a little bit of resistance. So go ahead and make fun of me for these uh, inductor and resistor symbols if you want, it's okay. Same thing here, the, we'd have these, uh, these inductors and resistance, uh, this inductance and resistance we would have over here on this switching element as well. So all of that stuff is stuff that you can include in the circuit diagram or in your schematics when you're actually designing this circuit. The question was actually asking about what do you do about the PCB layout? Well, this is actually something that's really challenging. You need to know the, the possible parasitics that might arise between different portions of the PCB layout. So just as an example, like this node here is commonly known to have some capacitance across this inductor. So there's some parasitic capacitance here and this arises depending on how you arrange these elements in this layout. So if this node is too close to this node, depending on how this is laid out, you can actually have some strong capacitance here that allows power to bypass your inductor. That's actually bad for uh, noise reduction. And that's bad for noise reduction because you want this inductor to act like a regular old inductor at any driving frequency in order to get low ripple on the output from this converter. Here in this loop, you actually have a lot of current going around in this loop. So this PWM could have fast switching action. So modern buck converters are using faster and faster uh, pulsing signals in order to you know, modulate these switching elements. And that drives a higher and higher DI DT value along this loop. So that can induce oscillations on the waveform and on the output. So the really the best place to simulate all of this is actually in the schematic and not necessarily in the PCB layout, especially if you have like a DC-DC converter. So in this case, what would we have? Well, if we had a really strong DIDT and we had a lot of parasitic inductance and we possibly even had a decent amount of parasitic capacitance, uh, what you would see is uh, on the, uh, the switching element, if we were to draw this out as a function of time, we would like to basically get these kind of nice pulses like this. So this is a you know reasonably low duty cycle. Um, but here, what we would actually get is we would get a little bit of overshoot. So it looks something like this when we have all this overshoot overlaid on this uh, series of pulses. And so that occurs because we actually have these parasitics in here. Another great example is here on the output when this capacitor is charging and discharging, on the output, you could have uh, your nominal voltage, and let's just say it's you know pretty nicely smoothed out. But each time there's a switching event, you would have just this little bit of oscillation overlaid on it. And it really depends on the size of the inductor, it depends on the ESR and ESL values of this capacitor, and you would actually wanna get rid of that because you don't wanna see these very strong oscillations coming off of the output of this converter. So this is another thing that's actually best simulated 
in your schematics because you can model all of these values uh, using, using wire inductances and using wire resistances to actually figure out what the output might look like due to these parasitics. So it's actually best done in the schematics. How do you solve like a problem like this? Well, to solve a problem like this, when you have a capacitor like this that is creating an oscillation, is actually to just intentionally put like a really small resistor here. And when I say like a really small resistor, we're just talking like, you know, few ohms. Um, I'm being real general here because I, you know, I can't tell you like, oh, it's going to be like five ohms for every X number of capacitance or anything like that. Um, but what I can say, it's usually a small amount of resistance that you want to put here. And the idea here is to just look at what this particular transient response is and bring it into the critically damped regime. That's actually really easy to calculate if you are familiar or you remember your engineering classes about uh, damped oscillators. So that's a typical kind of homework problem you might have to do if you ever want to, or if you are ever noticing this type of oscillation in your circuits. Just to kind of summarize, we've gone over a lot of different stuff here and actually figuring out some of these uh, capacitances and some of these inductances that exist in your board. Well, a lot of them exist in the components. Some of this stuff you can actually find online with little calculators and you can get a decent estimate of what's gonna happen in this, in this particular circuit while it's operating. Then to solve some of these problems, well, you just really need to do some simulations in SPICE. SPICE is gonna be a really nice and easy way to figure out if you're gonna have any of these problems with real component models, and then how to actually solve them. One thing that you can do is if you have a board level capacitance or a board level inductance, let's say, that is gonna cause a problem in this circuit, like maybe this guy, or maybe you don't know what the winding capacitance of this uh, uh, of this coil is going to be. So, you know, maybe the winding capacitance is with a spice simulator. You can actually iterate through different values of these parasitics and then check to see maybe what level of damping you need to dampen this type of oscillation, whatever the case may be. So play around with your spice simulator and just accept that you're kind of doing some modeling and you need to just you know, experiment with it in order to figure out what the best set of parameters is gonna be in order to get to a perfect design. Then after you do that and you finish your layout and you have the resources or you have an application to do it, then you can put your board into a more powerful field solver and that's actually gonna give you a lot more information. Coming up in another video, we have our PDN impedance simulation stuff that we're gonna be doing, um, but I think what I'll also do is I'll do something on the crosstalk and reflection waveform stuff because those do, do relate to parasitics and that'll be another great way to discuss what actually happens in the PCB layout versus what you need to do in the schematics. All right, everybody, so thanks for sitting through all this because I know there's a lot of information, but being able to spot where parasitics might exist in your PCB layout is actually really important. And don't forget, when you're looking at component data sheets, if it's a well-documented component, they will actually tell you if there are parasitics in that particular component. Stuff like winding capacitance is well known, it's measured, uh, inductor manufacturers generally provide it. Uh, ESL and ESR values, even if they don't give you the specific values, they may give you a curve that shows the impedance. You can figure out what those values are. All right, everybody. So. Thanks again for watching. If you like this video, hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, leave your questions and comments in the comments section, and definitely don't forget to call your fabricator, folks.